Hi everyone, I'm Dana and welcome back to Inverter Always. In today's video, I'm going to be walking you through how to set up the BACnet server on a Daikin ITM central controller. And I do have to stress the clarity that we are going to be programming the BACnet server where we are going to be sending all of the Daikin information to a different front end for control. We are not programming the BACnet client where the Daikin central controller is going to be handling all of the third-party equipment on a building. That is going to be different. We're not talking about that in today's video. It's the BACnet server specifically. Should be a good video, lots of information to cover you guys. So as always, if you do enjoy and if this is helpful for you, please click the like button below. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. All right, let's jump right in. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started today looking at a very familiar sheet on our desktop. This is something that we've talked about in previous videos within the series. This is your as-built sheet. Now, before you do anything on the ITM, one of the things that you're gonna to have to create is basically a unique instance number or device ID for each indoor unit that you're going to be sending information to uh, to the front end system. And what I'll typically do is create a new column that's right after my group addresses. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that now right here. And I'm gonna call that instance number. Now, when you're creating an instance number, the basic basic way of doing it is you're gonna start with 53. And that has something to do with the backnet code. And then the next number you're gonna use is the port number for the group address you programmed. And in the previous videos that we've done, we've programmed all of these indoor units for this example project that we've been working on, on port one. We wired everything directly to the ITM, so I'm gonna put a one. If for some reason you had put indoor units on one of the D3Net expansion modules and you programmed that expansion module as port two, then you would put port number two here. So we're going to keep it with a one. And then the last set of numbers is simply the group address. So because the group address for this unit is 1-01, the last three numbers is 101. And then we're going to repeat 531, 102, 531, 103, so on and so forth until we get done with all of our addresses. Now, once you guys are done programming in the instance numbers to your as-built, and this is just, again, for reference purposes, this saves on file, keeps things nice and organized later. It is important to note that when you have an ITM with a BACnet server license, you cannot send any information for the VAM ERVs to the front end. So the ITM is going to be the sole proprietor of your ERVs, that's not usually a big deal, but if it is, the ERVs do have a contact, uh, open contact that the backnet or front end system can turn the ERV on and off from. So if that is something that's needed, you can go ahead and do that. That's going to be field wiring that's required, has nothing to do with programming. Uh, but just FYI, you cannot send ERV data to the front end. So we have our nine indoor units here with the instance numbers programmed. And now we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna jump into the ITM. Now the screen you're gonna be looking for is called the BACnet server screen. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna back out, and I'm gonna walk you through the steps on how to get to that point. If you're looking at your ITM controller, you're gonna go into the menu, and then you're gonna go into the service settings. And that's the four corners that we've talked about before. And as long as you click that correctly, you type in the password or the lowercase daikin, and then you're gonna have this icon in the bottom of your screen. So when you click on this icon, it's going to give you all of the BACnet information. And this is going to be something you export to a USB stick off of the ITM after you've completely programmed the ITM and all of the indoor units. Once you do that, your spreadsheet's gonna look very similar to this but you're not going to have the device instance column. None of these numbers are going to be filled out. So you're gonna go back to that as-built sheet and you're gonna start plugging in the device instance number for each of your group addresses. Now, this is just an example that I pulled from a previous project so you can see what it looks like here. Once you're done with that, you're gonna go up here where you have your common settings you have your H and your D. We're not gonna go through in detail what all of these mean, but all this data at the very top, this is your ITM data. 
one of the most important things is programming the network number so that the ITM is on a unique network. This network number has to be for the ITM only. No other device on the BACnet network can match the same network number as the ITM. If it does, then the BACnet system will not be able to see any of the information pulled from the ITM. So it's very important that you make sure whoever the integrator is on the BACnet side of things understands that our network number can be whatever it needs to be, but it needs to be a unique network number. All right, the control device instance number can also be whatever it needs to be. And I simply just selected 53 here in this particular example, but you can choose whatever you need to choose. I try to coordinate with the integrator ahead of time. I send him my as-built sheet with all of these points on it so that he knows exactly what all of my points are going to look like. And he's going to tell me, I want you to program your ITM for this instance number and this network number. And almost always your backnet port number is just going to be 47808. None of the rest of the stuff really needs to change, at least not most of the time, very, very rarely. So we're not going to get into it in today's video. Today's video is really focused on just making sure that you get the basic stuff set up. The nice thing about BACnet server is there's very, very little that you have to program on the Daikin side of things. Once you get these instance numbers filled in, great. We can move on to some of these other columns. Now, when you're looking at the points list, so what batch of points for each indoor unit do I want to send to the integrator or to the front end? There's going to be a whole list of them. I mean, tons and tons. You have your basic things like on, off, set point, room temperature, things like that. But then there's like a bunch of other stuff that you don't always need. Have a conversation with the integrator ahead of time. Send them the points list and then discuss what points you actually need. Because sending them all the points is just sending them unnecessary points that they don't need, they're gonna have to sort through all those points then, it's just more of a headache, it takes more time. So just give them what they need and have that conversation ahead of time. So back here on our desktop, we're gonna be looking at each of these points and I'm not gonna go into immense detail as to what all these points are and what all these points mean, but I am gonna give you just a quick breakdown on some of them. So occupancy mode, is going to be one of the more important points to send. Now, occupancy mode is going to be counterintuitive to what you might think it means. When the integrator puts the system into occupied, it's gonna turn on all of your equipment. When you put the system into unoccupied, it's going to turn off all of the equipment. And so what we'll typically do is we'll send occupied mode to the integrator to the front end. And basically any point that has a value of one means yes, enable that point. If the value has a, a zero, that means no, do not send that point. We're going to send this point to the integrator and then explain to him, hey, every time you make a change on the schedule, we want to make sure that we're sending an occupied mode signal. Do not put any of the equipment in unoccupied because it turns them off and we do not want to turn our units off. Leave them on and then just change the occupied heating and cooling set points, which we'll take a look at here shortly. You have your unit on off status and that's pretty self-explanatory. Is your unit on or off? We have our alarm status. Is there an alarm or no alarm? Now, with the alarm status, you get a general alarm on the front end. You don't get all the specific alarm details like you do on the ITM. So if there is ever an error code that shows up on the front end, you're going to need to go to the ITM to see what the specific code is. Operation mode is pretty self-explanatory as well. Heat, cool, etc. Room temperature. This is going to be the same room temperature that's displayed on the ITM for each unit. That room temperature could vary because it could be either the thermostat temperature or the return air temperature, depending on how you programmed all the indoor unit field settings earlier on during the commissioning. Next, we have our occupied cooling set point and our occupied heat set point. These are the two set points that you want the integrator to change 
for each of the scheduled actions. Remember, we want to keep occupancy mode as occupied to keep the units physically turned on. And then we're just going to make a set point change for the actual occupied hours of the day. And then we're going to make another occupied heating and cooling set point change for the unoccupied hours or the evening or whenever the building is empty. Always leave it in occupied though, otherwise you're going to have problems. Unoccupied cooling set point and unoccupied heat set point at that point you don't need. So technically these columns could be zeroed out. We're not going to use these points. And if you're not going to use these points, don't send these points. The maximum cooling set point and the minimum cooling set point along with the maximum heat and the minimum heat, these are just like what we were playing with on the ITM. So you can give the integrator or front end control of setting max and min range set point restrictions at the thermostat. Same thing with your minimum set, set point differential. We programmed this in a previous video along with the cooling and heating set point tracking mode. All this stuff, this is just your user control, how you want to set up your set points, dual set point, single set point. You can set all that up from the integrator side as well. So I send these points and then if they have questions about it, I'll talk to them about how to set that stuff up. Fan speed, airflow direction, pretty basic, self-explanatory. Your timed override operation, we're not going to use this. You don't need to send it, but you can if you want. Basically, your timed override operation is your timer, that extension timer. And the verbiage is just weird. So that's your extension timer. The current unit operation point monitors the indoor unit operating status against the indoor unit status managed by the ITM. Super confusing. I know we don't typically use this point. Your remote controller prohibit. This is your lockouts for on off, your lockouts for mode, and your lockout for set point. Then you have your filter sign status and your filter sign reset. So we didn't talk about this because it never popped up on any of the previous videos programming, but basically every now and then you'll see a little icon that pops up that says, hey, your filter needs to be cleaned and then you need to reset that. And there's a little button that pops up that allows you to reset it. This just gives the integrator that status and the ability to reset it. Indoor fan status, pretty self-explanatory. Communication status, also pretty self-explanatory. Here's my thermal on status. This tells the front end whether or not it's actively calling for heating or cooling or if it's satisfied. Then we have a bunch of other points that you can choose to send forward or not. And all the rest of these points are basically going to be all your performance data. So your compressor status, is your compressor running or not? Do you have auxiliary heaters turned on or not? Is anything being forced off or not? What is your indoor unit changeover option, right? So do you have auto uh, enabled on the ITM or not for that unit? Return air temperature, discharge air temperature. It's going to be on your indoor unit, your liquid pipe temperature, your gas pipe temperature, expansion valve position, and whether or not the unit is in a freeze protection state or not. So all your indoor data. A lot of information to send forward. Now you'll notice that some of these say NA and that is because those points cannot be pushed forward. So if something says NA, it cannot be pushed forward. If it says one, it will be pushed. And if it says zero, it will not be pushed. You can see here that I've basically programmed everything to be pushed to the front end on this particular job. And that's because they wanted everything. They weren't going to use everything, but just in case they wanted the ability to program something, they wanted to have that access. Once you get your spreadsheet all set up, totally completed and filled in like this, you're going to save it. Now, when you save it, do not change the name of the file. Leave it as BACnet server data. The reason is because when you go back to the ITM and plug in that USB drive, now I'm going to import all of that data and cross your fingers that you didn't program anything incorrectly. You want it to say succeeded. And if it did, congratulations, you have successfully imported all of the BACnet data. And now you can go back to the integrator, your front end manager and say, all right, we're good. We're sending you all of our points. Can you now test and see our points? Um, most of the systems these days can auto discover all of our points and some systems cannot. So it just depends on your application, whether or not your integrator will be able to just automatically see all of the Daikin points or, or not. And that's why I try to have that conversation ahead of time with the integrator. It's a partnership. You 
just don't want to just give them the information and then say saranara you want to help them let's just make sure this gets done smoothly and of course now that we get to the end of the video i realized there was one really important thing that i didn't tell you at the beginning i guess it's a really good reason that you stayed and watched the entire video so when you guys are doing a backnet server or even a backnet client even though that wasn't part of this video you have to plug in the activation code the license and you can see here that it doesn't give me the ability to add a license and that's because i'm on the pre-setup software on my computer but when you're actually at the itm there is going to be a long code that you should have received from your uh, vendor your rep or from the factory directly if you are a vendor or a rep you're going to plug that code in make sure before you type in the code and this is going to be super important that you verify on your documentation where that license is printed that it is for the correct item that you're adding so for example if i need to add the backnet server for the itm make sure you read the description of that license that it says backnet server for the itm because there's also backnet for other devices and there's also a backnet client which is not the same as backnet server so you need to make sure that it is correct because if you input the wrong license you can't remove the license you have to send the itm back to daikin have them remove the license and it's it's a whole catastrophe that you just don't want to deal with it's a headache so make sure to verify that that license is for the correct software and then at that point, you'll go ahead and you'll put it into the ITM, activate the license, and then go through all the steps that we just went through in today's video, you guys. So I hope today's video was helpful. I know that BACnet can sometimes be overwhelming. The BACnet server side of things is usually pretty simple. The BACnet client definitely gets a little bit more, uh, I guess I would say, robust and a little bit stressful from time to time. But as long as you're communicating with your integrator, and if you guys have a controls contractor that you are partnering with to make this all happen, that goes a long way having that conversation ahead of time to know what points you're going to need to program so you're not just starting from complete scratch and scratching your head and, and, and crying in the corner because believe me, it's happened. But guys, that's going to be it for today. So if you enjoyed today's video, please click the like button below. It really helps out my channel. And if you guys haven't already, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching Inverter Always, you guys. I hope you all have an awesome day.